Well, it looks like we're all arrived. So how about we get started? Ready then. Welcome everybody to the Propeller 2 live forum early adopter series. I think this is our fourth event so far. They've been really interesting and very productive. Um, today we have James Casca talking about a product he's been working on and the presentation is entitled Visual Programming with Touch Logic Control and Tacos. So before um, we let him go, and I should introduce him, by the way, James, thanks for joining us. Yes, welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, some small items. Does everybody know today is National Video Game Day? It's July 8th, and I want to know if anybody can name this game, the year, the software. Oh, you. <laughs> All right, aside from Chip, what company made it? Rotorbot. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so Broderbun in the year was? Blinks there. 82? Yeah, and the operating system was? Apple II. Yeah, pretty cool. I actually remember when you cracked that game. I should have uh, muted you. About the display, yeah, you've seen all my noise as I try to sell you things as usual. Um, we're just waiting for those to come in stock. We've got 180 and I'm working on the long-term supply. I, I think we'll have it without trouble. Um, Erna pointed out we need to standardize as much as possible so we could share code. And as soon as I can verify, we'll have these for the long haul. I'll let everybody know so the objects can be written around them um, and allow us to share a little more. I'll post the code for the birds here if anyone's interested in that. And then today, thanks for everybody on the forums for finding us the right cable um, through scant information I posted with no calipers and a ruler. They produced this connector, which is cheap enough that we could just throw into the display package. So if you are ordering a one of these, or if you already did order one of these, like many of you have, because there are 40 of them on back order already, and you want to add this display, so you've already got an order in with us, just send an email to sales at parallax.com, and then we can um, add the display to your Propeller 2 evaluation board without dealing with more shipping fees. So that's no problem. And these boards are finally on the production line today after lots of um, false starts. So now we're rolling, everything looks good. Um, tomorrow morning we'll have our first articles and we'll be in the selective solder machine by afternoon. So chips, this is what we've got. We've got 2,500 until October, um, which is pretty good supply. I mentioned last week I did place the production order. So we have the real deal coming in October. And the P2 evaluation board, um, still chatting with Rich. He's getting his laser up and running. I saw a picture of his shop. It was an absolute mess, but he cleared a corner with the broom and with the forklift and he got his laser up and running so he could make some more of these. So the Propeller 2 accessory set. Um, just wanted your, all of your input. What's happening now is kind of what we anticipated. There are some other boards getting made by other people. There's a Wi-Fi programming adapter, an RS-485 board is coming, and Parallax has also made a Micro-E microbus adapter. So um, it's gonna be a lot of work for us. We're actually running these on one up through the pick and place, and we're gonna have to divide them up. I think this is kind of what our community would like us to do as well if I'm not mistaken, so you can buy individual boards. Anyone have any input on that? I'm just trying to delay the inevitable. You wanna buy individual boards probably, yeah, so we're gonna split them up. Um, anyway, about micro E micro bus. I don't know if you're all familiar with them, but um, we've met with them recently. They're in Serbia and the P2 will be available through Mauser and DigiKey and Mauser um, and many others have pointed us to Microbus as a way to get access to a thousand different boards. Um, these guys are incredibly productive. They put out one board per day and Mauser carries most all of them. So we have made an adapter for the Propeller 2 evaluation board and that should be available like within 
I don't know, a few weeks so that you can access all the micro bus boards from micro E. If you haven't looked at it, go take a look. Um, the website is micro.com, M-A-K-R-O-E.com. And you can read about, um, see all the different boards that are available. There's just everything. And so really our goal is to focus on what we need to do, which is the objects and the software not make a lot of hardware this time. That's done by others very well already. And if you haven't uh, been receiving our email, hopefully you all are, there are three new objects added to the GitHub. Um, Nick Benison's simple SPI flash object and then two more from Johnny Mac. Thanks a lot, Johnny Mac. Yeah, we really appreciate that. You are holding the record for number of objects right now on our GitHub. <laughs> Next week, we'll hear from Chip. Spin to debug with runtime expression. He's been working nonstop. He just woke up, as a matter of fact, um, on this debugging tool, and he's very excited about it. So I'm looking forward to him sharing what he's got going. And today, most importantly, Welcome, James. James is um, actually another informal member of Team Oz, but he lives in the Netherlands. And the website where he features his efforts are, is virtualbreadboard.com, if you want to check that out. And today he's talking about visual programming with touch logic control and tacos. So James, have at it. All righty then. You can take over screen share. How does it work again? Look for the black ribbon. It should be on the bottom of some display. It kind of hides itself. And then you'll see a green button in the middle. It says new share. Here we go. Screen share. Oh, probably I need to stop sharing. Okay, now you can take it. Have I managed to take over the screen now? Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, so I, I prepared a much longer PowerPoint presentation um, style thing, um, but I realized it was far too long. So it's going to end up being two, maybe even three um, presentations possibly. Um, but we'll begin with this um, much simplified tutorial style thing, um, which is much closer to what I originally talked about, you know, as it being what I would do. Um, I was watching Peter's uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago now um, on his taco stuff. And I, having never touched forth, um, I kind of knew a little bit about what he was doing, but I kind of had the epiphany, the ping in the head that said, oh, I, I know what I can do. I can use that taco stuff as a as a back end to some of this other work I've done with TLC. And TLC is my, uh, a visual programming language of my own invention. Um, it's benefiting or using Virtual Breadboard, which is a product I've developed now for quite a while. And some of the um, characteristics of Virtual Breadboard to make truly visual programming happen. So I thought about how I could do all that and I thought, well, nothing better than a blank slate. So I'm gonna start completely from scratch <laughs> and uh, show what we can do. So I have a new project here. So this is kind of tutorial style, but jump in anytime, to ask questions. And what we need, of course, is a development board. We need a, um, a P2 evaluation development board. So there's this feature called a component development kit, which allows you to create components in Virtual Breadboard. And it supports dragging and dropping. So we can at least take a, the image of what we want to make. And we need to mark it up, OK? So the idea is that we're going to I can keep my cool about it, um, mark up this thing in a way that we can use it as a component. And 
sort of had a few practice runs on this. Let's see if I can do it in a live environment. So we're going to start with uh, two pins. Uh, pin, uh, what's this one? 48, is it? And this one is pin 56. So these are properties. So this is enough to get started. So in the this is the component side and, and this is the breadboard side. Well, it's kind of a, is it a breadboard? It's more of an abstract design tool. It has a different collection of components compared to the component development kit. And one of the components is a CDK component. I always forget this one step. I need to give it a name. So we'll call it P2 eval. And that means in the component, I can select it. So over here now I have a um, an sort of an active component. Now we can market this. That's not the only thing I need to do. Um, to use this as a TLC controller, uh, I just remembered. Go back to the, I need to mark it up as a TLC. Post and the runtime in this case is Tuckles. So I sync up my device. So now this thing is an active TLC controller. Um, go back to my project because I want to add a TLC sheet. And this is the TLC sheet. This is where we are going to build the program. And first of all, we need to have something to program with. Um, pick a little jumper and put that on here. And So this is just obviously the classic hello world type thing. Um, now, how do you program it? Well, TLC, this is the magic, right? Assuming that it all works. <laughs> TLC is an interactive programming tool. So you take an action and it records what you're doing uh, over here as an icon. So we say, well, okay, when this is on, we want this to be this LED wants to be on. And when it's off, we want this LED to be off. And when we play that, we build a program. And when we press program here now, We have tacos. So this generated tacos out of that simple program, such that we can come to our uh, terminal. Hello. Yeah. Paste it. Move on. And do I have the right LEDs in the right places? Yeah, so this is, this is obviously the basic walkthrough. Uh, 
So now I have it in, the, in here and I can press this thing and turn the light on and off. Okay, so that's the Hello World version <laughs> of DLC with tacos. Okay, so what happened then is that <clears throat> if we go back to our project, we might want to do expand on, on this a little bit. So we're going to zip in and add a few more pins. in these ones, I guess. Hey, James, I have a question. Yep. So this is kind of interesting. That Did you take the, the picture of the Rev C board and uh, shrink it to a pixel size that allows you to, to have all of the pins on a grid? In this case, I did, yes. <laughs> I, you can, you, I, I, I have a pin, a particular pin size that I, I, I did that, yes. Um, but it also de -res made it de-resolute slightly. So what you can do is actually, if there was a bigger one, I would put it to double uh, the pin grid size so when I zoomed in it would be a higher res and usually you use vector graphics for this actually this is oh, bitmaps yeah. and not what you normally use this is more SVG engine actually and typically you would use SVG so most of the other components and so that's also why you can drag and drop fits and components into here um, the SVG is 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 the back end of it but um, bitmaps are obviously uh, a lot easier uh, sync. So we, we've now updated our uh, pins over here. Let me just check that I uh, 60, what is it? 58, 60, 62. Right? So I messed up. Okay, so let's sync up again and uh, Let's add a few more. Ones I feel a bit, a bit there because little trick you need to have unique IDs, but uh, that's just a hidden hidden trick. <laughs> uh, and back to our TLC now, so we can expand on our project. Um, Get some project ideas. Okay, so James, I'm looking yep. at this software you've made is really pretty. How did you come up with all these little icons and everything? Did you design those yourself, or were those available somewhere? These ones here, or in the well, whole like screen? Over on the right. Yeah, like over yes. on the right side, you, there's all kinds of stuff. That LEDs, up. buttons, the ICs. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, all of this is uh, my own creation. So, uh, wow, you're an artist. So I'm, I'm half artist, maybe, and half engineer. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to show off a few things. Uh, Right, so all these sort of icons. But this is, this it is, uh, must be that you have a tremendous advantage here because you've. This is a lot of Arduino work, right? Right. So you've been at this exactly. for a while here. So the Arduino um, side of things, well, it's a long history of this product. Um, it, it began uh, sort of on the Pic Micros and uh, Basic Stamp One, actually, many years ago, and then sort of. When the Arduino came around, I supported that, and that helped grow the, num the number of users. But it also changed the business a little bit. 
and uh, this has been an evolution. So this is what you see as Windows Universal now. So it began out, began in sort of VB, classic VB, and then VB.net, and then C Sharp, and then Windows Universal. So it's been quite a, a maintenance update nightmare, to be honest. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll show you just a couple of basic uh, tricks here. So the key thing is it's a recording language. So it's like an authoring language. So if we make this second one, I did it, I did, sometimes it's a bit tricky. Uh, I kind of did that a bit wrong because I just want to show you the idea of a, an AND gate. And then I'll open some existing examples just to sort of accelerate things a little. Um, so if we, if I go back here, my problem is if I put the, the pins too close together, you won't easily see the snapshot difference. Fifty. Forty-eight, fifty, fifty-two, and fifty-four. Okay. So you know, since James mentioned the BS one, it's starting to jog my memory. I kind of feel like uh, we have corresponded, maybe even twenty plus years ago. It's. Uh, it's my, I wasn't really heavily involved. Um, it, it's possible. Uh, uh, maybe I did. Yeah. A while, a long while ago. That's possible. So let's call this a, um, like an, an enable, right? What I want to show here is that it, you, you, uh, Automatically generating. Go down here. Automatically creating uh, the visual. I'm going to talk and do as a, as a, as a thought. <laughs> um, let's call that. Uh, I don't know. Let me put something. So, if we go back to TLC. Okay, so now we have some more things to play with, some more things to write programs with. And uh, let's say when it's enabled, um, then if you press the blink button, so it's enabled and it's blink, then you will flash, uh, say, for one second, and then you will flash off. Okay. Um, and if it's disabled, then it will be off. And to complete the picture, if you press on, while the disable is like so, then it'll be off. So here we have a, what I call a storyboard. And so you're building a visual um, version of the of the the application, and uh, yeah, then you can click grab your TLC, pressing program.
Okay, so that's the TLC version of that application. Um, but I haven't got this thing set up with two buttons. Really. James, can you access anyway. the code for running it outside of TLC? So, um, I'm not sure the question. Um, so you generated some tacos code, right? Yeah. And I didn't see it on the screen, but can you uh, access okay. it, copy yeah. it out, and then? Yeah, yeah. I just copied it to the clipboard. Sorry, this this copies it to the clipboard. And then, can you also view the code in yeah, TLC? Okay. Yeah. So this is this is the actual tacos that it generated. And. Uh, Okay, I'm wondering if you're sharing um, the whole desktop because I didn't see it. Oh, okay. Uh, you might be sharing just screen. the application, yeah. So maybe we've missed a few things there. Oh, okay. and then do share desktop, and then pick the right desktop. Don't worry, the the forumistas will start plotting us with questions quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, how do I even do that? Um, go down to share screen right. again, and you've probably right. chosen an yep, app, yep, yep, then yep. choose desktop. I think yep. that's what you have is one desktop. You share. Uh, share. This one, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so now you're sharing another app, so you'll need to switch back when you return. Okay. This is just a no, no, That works. So this is the, um, the the code that I automatically generate out of that visual tree, okay? Um, and uh, it's it's pretty verbose, but it does the job, and it's it's about being having the ability to run it external. Let me just pull up that picture I showed you from the another plus one for tacos. Yeah, let me just, let me just. I don't even full screen that. So conceptually here, um, this is what I convert this application into. Now, inside of virtual breadboard, you know, that, that is coded as an object tree. So it's not really code like it's not C sharp or C plus plus or anything like that. Internally, it's stored as like a, the closest thing would be like what you would call a JSON tree, or it's just an object tree internally. I think so you've you lost the, question, the um, James. I think you've lost the dis, the image of the um, the block diagram you had. If you're trying yeah, to show yeah, no, that. I was just right. I was just explaining that because you asked, can you see the the code of the um, the talk the this application, the TLC application, and then the answer is there isn't really a program. It's a it's an object representation, which I then convert into different backends, so different um, code engines, so to speak. And Tacos is particularly useful for this particular style of programming because it's inherently parallel. You see, so each of these sequences here, these are all threads. These are all these all get launched in cogs. So you have a, a trigger state, you, and I'm, I'll switch, switch back to this, but just understand that each of these sequences of events, which can be time, timing loops and timing and blinking and, and servos and all sorts of things, um, just if you, you know, we, we, you, you build up these um, programs by these sort of event generators, okay? Um, and the end result though is that these sequences, Run on run on on a thread, a thread being a cog thread, and so let's go back to here. So, simply how it works, and uh, there's room for you know optimization and so forth. But we have a front loaded scanning change loop, which is um, going through and looking for changes in any of the the inputs, the so changes in input pins, changes in variables, 
and that's just sitting there in, in cog zero. Right? So then when it finds, and each particular thing, like say an input pin, an input pin can be linked to multiple conditions. So each of these triggers, each of these triggers might have more than one, you know, the, all of them, they're all three of them have got like a, a pin as an input. So one, this particular pin then will, will be linked to multiple condition trees. So if this changes and it searches these three conditions, so it does a scanning loop looking for change. And then it, as this, per, in this case, it's trivial, but as it gets larger, that cuts down on the number of conditions that gets tested because you're only tested, testing on change. And ultimately you'd link this into more optimized ways like uh, interpreters and things like that, uh, sorry, interrupt and things like that. But visually when it, when it, um, the TLC code, uh, if I look, pull up also this uh, code that gets generated and we, 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 we zoom down. So let me just open the window here so get some air in the place. I'll try to step through a little bit. Um, so this is a, obviously not optimized. I, I learned this in just this last weekend. So <laughs> like four days of fourth year. So I'm sure Peter will look at this and go, oh my God, you did that. <laughs> um, but the fourth as it comes down, it, it declares the variables as it comes along. So I've got a, a thread. Uh, of like a mini RTOS in a certain sense. It's um, I have these busy flags and, and notify flags, um, which are maintaining which cogs are currently in use. And so then, uh, I guess this is, this becomes a sort of scheduler to schedule sort of a thread pool. Uh, the cogs are running on a type of thread pool, I guess. And uh, so here I'm, I'm managing the, the pin values, and and uh, so this is where I declare everything. Uh, the current trigger state, you know, so if it's already running, it doesn't start again. And, uh, and then it initializes all those values typically to zero um, after it's declared. I'm sure there's a faster way of doing that. And there's this, this initial cog. I mean, Peter has it so that you, uh, it doesn't automatically load, but uh, I need them all loaded because it becomes a, a pool of uh, cogs. So I load them, um, using this in cogs and that gets called sort of first thing. And <clears throat> then when I want to allocate a cog, so say one of these events, so a change has happened in some input and then a trigger, which is just a, a condition. It's like an and group of uh, like pins or variables and, and, and other things which get added together to say this, this has, a, you know, conditions have been met. And then it'll launch the cog to run the sequence. And uh, this is done here, which is uh, it's an allocating a cog. So it's just searching for a cog that isn't currently busy. And it uh, basically gives the ID of the cog that's not busy and then it launches it. Once, this, once, a, once a sequence, so once it's running, then it, it can be a long running cog or a short running cog. So, you know, it's, um, probably if there's no, uh, an optimization is if there's no wait states in, in the middle, then you wouldn't launch a cog, you just execute it. But anything with weights in it is going to get uh, run, on, run on, a, on a cog. So it's going to run its sequence of logic, which, which end up just being fourth statements. So the whole thing is just one great big fourth um, linear stream of, of fourth uh, words. And then the cog gets freed up. So then it gets put back onto the pool um, and so this becomes a, a shared pool, and then you know, obviously. Uh, hold on. Yeah. If you get a very large number, obviously you know you run into problems with running out of cogs and things like that later. But uh, you know, this is just the, the getting started version, right? Um, so these are the triggers. It, it's 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 looking. This is. If you, if you come down here and look at the scanner, so the scope that was sort of the top down, so the bottom up, I guess. So we're, we're going to run it, we're going to initialize the cogs, and we're going to sit in this scanning loop. 
inside of the scanning loop, we are, we are just looking for changes. I guess this is a bit like your key scanner that you, you mentioned, Peter, for if you're looking for key presses or whatever. So similar idea, it's just gonna loop through this thing, looking for changes in, in, in the things that it's monitoring, which can be um, inputs or variables. And also it has a shared um, write uh, pin writing system because in the first cog, because if in a particular cog, it actually sets the, the um, what do you call it, the, the IO, then it forgets it when it comes out of the, when the cog gets uh, released uh, at the end. And so then very simply, it's um, monitoring a sort of a mailbox here and uh, sets the pin high and low. And these are the, the events which are monitoring changes on the pins. And if a pin changes, then it's going to test each of the triggers that it belongs to. And uh, if, it, if it triggers, um, it will then call the allocation and launch the, the sequence. So that's all what's happening in the background. Now, of course, uh, you don't need to know that. <laughs> that's sort of auto-generated um, by the, the code framework. Um, Oh, yeah, I don't know if you guys really care about going through the details of fourth. So this is the, 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 I guess, the summary. So now we'll do some more examples which might be interesting. So first of all, we need to know that um, once we have a, um, Once you've built a component, one of the, the features of Virtual Breadboard that I'm really working towards is um, to have a, a shared library, online library, where you, you create components and then you publish them. So really the long-term goal is to have, uh, make it easy enough for people to create their own components inside Virtual Breadboard and then publish them. So this is where this um, other website comes in the, the, the virtual breadboard IO website. So this is sort of um, the control panel, I guess. Uh, when you log in, you can manage different things. Um, and one of them is your components. So at the moment we don't see any components here, but uh, let's just publish. By the way, did that come up on your screen? This, do you see a browser there? Yeah, okay. Cause, before we were getting muddled up. Um, okay, so we go back to here and then uh, you can you can put in uh, information about, so, you know, if you're developing, Peter, a, a P2, D, uh, D2, P2, D2 component, maybe you come in here and you edit it up, finish it all off, you know, put all the pins in the right places, etc. And uh, you'd put in some information about it, you know, available from Parallax. This, this will goes onto the published page, you know. Um, even spell that. What am I doing? Um, and then you uh, you press publish. Uh, so it's really a component publishing system I'm building uh, ultimately. And uh, we successfully published that. James, so now this I would have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so basically you are running some sort of a simulator of the P2 wire on the desktop. Right. And then you are generating code for let's say in force. But you could also generate the same code for the Arduino or whatever. Yeah, so that's the that, intermediate format with your object tree and then you are generating code for different um, components. Or yeah, so that is possible. I haven't done it yet. Um, the idea would be to um, implement a different backend, different code generator. But the thing about it is, is TLC is so different itself because it's this parallel concept that this is better suited to the P2, which is why I, I pick, picked it up because uh, otherwise on an Arduino, you need a, like a proper RTOS and things like that to manage 
spinning up and spinning down different threads and so it's possible yeah but it's more complicated see what i mean so this is this my, my, here idea, is, my question is basically um it looks a little bit like that letter lock logic thing you know? it you does know, you def define different tasks which can run parallel or should run parallel um and that is perfectly for the p2 or even for the p1 um, yeah but, That's why I call it T TLC instead of PLC. It's very, very. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's very closely related to to, to ladder logic, yeah. um, but with the additional element that it's 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 marked up visually. I'll just yeah, it's so that, really, way way more beautiful for sure. I like so it. I'll just show you here if I refresh how, how now. You, how you, let, let's say how you. If you run it in a simulation on your on your desktop, um, you basically run your object tree and not really the emulator of the P two or something. that's right. Okay, yes. yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, nice. Oh, that's what. I like it. It's very nice. But there's a but there is a, this is all related though. What you're saying is very related. The the, the exchange and this is really the bigger picture for Virtual Breadboard itself is. The, ex the exchanging of what's really happening underneath um, is sort of abstracted away and it's not Im it becomes not important to what's how it's actually running um, and so this is this concept of of what uh, the other major project for the p2 that I'm working on is called an avatar and so the yeah, idea but there what I, but what I see as a problem is then when you have more parallel executing things, then you have Cox, uh, how you handle that? Yeah, so that's that's the biggest issues. And then how do you manage uh, if you run out of cogs and then you then you, then you you run into, um, let's call this at the professional end, you know, when you've got a very large PLC system or something like that, where you need to then have additional code and then policy decisions. I mean, that gets quite complicated. You've got to, but at, at this level for education, I think this is less of an issue. So this shared pool, and at least the initial application for me is, uh, is more closely related to the education market for beginning programming, robotics, uh, this sort of thing. Um, and also for people building, you know, like tinkering around with, at Arduino level, not necessarily running you know, hundreds of uh, queues, uh, you know, simultaneous threads. But but your point's very valid that um, as the project gets bigger and it starts hitting up, you know, against its upper end of the, the number of available threads, the thread pool can get um, challenged. And so then you have to think about how you need, you need policies for that. You know. Also, then you look for other optimizations. How could I run this not on a thread? How do I do what I did with obviously C Sharp and .NET and all that is that they, they, they move to this async model but then the whole point is that you're adding massive complexity at the um, software end to achieve the threading and what we're doing here is having this simplicity of we're trading off complex hardware here for simplified software yeah but um, what i find very uh, uh, impressive is uh, your graphical uh, design and um the idea to kind of put stuff together on a virtual board i mean the whole thing doesn't work just with the two. I mean, it's kind of the grand idea behind it. Could you explain that a little bit more? Like sure. switches or, or whatever, how, 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 how you do that? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll just finish this train of thought and then I'll, I'll come back to the broader picture of virtual breadboard in a moment. I'll, I'll how are we doing for time? 45. So. Okay, let me let me just hold that thought. Give me five more minutes, and then I'll come back to the broader picture of virtual breadboard because uh, there's a few key little demos that I want to show you here. So the first thing to notice is I've, I published my P2 component, so then you can use that now in in other projects. Um, so it wasn't there before, and now I published it, so, that, so now it's here. So I, I did that because I wanted to create a different project. Um, Uh, having deleted it, <laughs> probably removed other other working projects. 
Um, so let's, let's, let me just show you a couple of things that might be interesting to you, um, especially this concept of um, servo programming and, and uh, inference um, logic. I don't know if this is going to work because I deleted, no, no, this is not, okay. So this is a program where, where, where you've got in fact, server programming, which is important to um, robotics. And so when I was building this, a lot of questions come up like, well, how do you handle analog and how do you handle these sort of things inside of a, a visual project? And well, obviously the idea here is that uh, if you had take a, an, analog, oh, an analog range, you can build a, a servo controller program from, from only two, two things and the way that works is that uh, you say well where is it where do, where's it where's it going to be where do I want where do I want the servo to be when the analog voltage is here say and so that I'll set that and then you you physically move okay well I want it to be here okay so you see this is we're programming all these programs without any code you get that like uh, we now are moving this over here and we say well when it when it's here then then I'm going to move the servo is going to be over here. Okay, so that's edit mode and you have a little visual cue for how that works in place. So now when I press run, I've got my, my servo controller. So this is using a type of inferencing. So it merges these two concepts together to create uh, like a, almost a fuzzy logic controller, I guess. So if you put two of these together with the two servos, you, you've got a line follower, for example. So you can very quickly build very uh, you know useful little projects um, using some of these uh, techniques that I'm kind of integrating into this TLC stuff. I'll just give you a couple of other demos. Um, so you've all seen the micro bit, and the micro bit has uh, this. Uh, interactive display which they use in um, some of their um, maker code applications and stuff and so this way um, what, this product here this is what I'm calling the bread boy this has got a p2 in it and this is what I'll talk about next time um, in more detail uh, but so it's also able to then run this 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 TLC code because it's got a p2 in there and well, this this application here um, is a, a rock paper scissors application. This is the other thing you can do with this TLC stuff. You can inject tests. So here I'm clicking on this to inject the the, the you know this is emulating like a um, in this case uh, an accelerometer shake you know. Um, and so with the TLC you can inject code in, into the application. So, but to program this, you can uh, sort of, we have a, uh, like an editing system here. So you can build new programs. Um, the canary. So you can, you can uh, not do that. Uh, my, my, this is a brand new feature, obviously, which has just killed my, killed my app, killed my app. <laughs> oh, that didn't really work out. Stop with that one, and it need to be running, I suppose. No, it's not going to play. Normally, you can edit this screen. I was, I was just working on that today. So, anyway, the bottom line is that you build you, you build up these um, whole projects by interacting with the the virtual breadboard elements, and that is um, only possible because of the virtual breadboard itself. So, it's kind of you need the system itself before you can start using it as an editor for the programs. And so without any code, we've, we've built 
that you can build all sorts of different applications. Uh, sorry. So we're having some trouble here. This is um, right. So anyway, what are we at? Forty fifty one. Let me go back to the broader picture then. Um, Virtual breadboard itself, you know, it's an environment where you can um, so obviously Arduino is the the popular thing that people play with here, and so we have the ability to uh, emulate. Arduino applications inside of virtual breadboard. Um, and we've got lots of built-in examples sort of to help people work through all these sort of things. This is really nice. So there's some more fun examples, uh, you know. What's the programming environment you use to develop this, James? This is um, um, Visual Studio, uh, C Sharp, for Windows Universal environment. And so this program is available in the Windows Store. Um, by the way, so this is now. I want to. I'm going to lead up to something interesting here, um, which you might, I'm going to surprise you maybe, because I want to. I'm tying in some examples here um, to a, the bigger picture, which I'll come in, which I'll talk about next week or next time, if you, if it is well. So this is uh, simulating the um, the Neo pixels, and this is this is all actual Arduino code, of course. So running, you know, normally you have the Arduino IDE and you drag and drop the, the hex file onto this simulator to run it. Now, what you might not notice, it might not realize though, is that every example I've shown you with the Arduino is actually running on a real Arduino. So presently, this application is running in, on the real Arduino. This is a, this chip here is a 80 mega 328. That's, and this chip here is um, a PIC 18F um, 4K, uh, K42. Which is one of the, one of the newer microchips, which has got pin mappable uh, pins. So what's, technically happening right now is that this Arduino is sending out its actual um, NeoPixel code, um, which is being captured by this, pic, this chip here. And then it's being encoded and sent to Virtual Breadboard, which you see on the screen. And all those examples I, I, I gave you are doing the same thing. Um, and this is what I call an avatar. So what I'm doing is enabling um, real physical devices, like with the AT Mega here, to um, communicate with virtual breadboard as if it's in, inside of the matrix, I, I like to call it. You know. So it's embedded inside the matrix. Now I, ha I have, um, a more advanced version of this product, uh, which is the, the shield version, which I call 
the um, the hollow shield. So instead of the peak micro, which is on that other device, um, it uh, works with the, the propeller doing the same job to capture the, the signals, the electrical signals, in this case, the SPI, the high-speed SPI, uh, sorry, the high-speed um, NeoPixel uh, WS28, whatever it is, um, which has got a pretty tight timing diagram, by the way. So I made another version of this product with a, an LCD on it and uh, with the, the propeller over here. With the idea of you replacing the, um, the, the, the PIX peripheral set with the, the, pro the propeller for the, so that I can have any peripheral on any pin to increase the number of possible virtual hardware that I can create. The problem was the P2 ran out of gas, basically. It, 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 sorry, the P1 on these devices, it, it ran out of gas. I couldn't, I couldn't get it to do what I needed to do. So I've been, I've been waiting. This bigger screen has become, oh, did I drop out somehow? Can you guys hear me? I, I seem to have dropped yep, down. Yep, we hear you. Somehow. Looks like your video stopped for some reason. I'm back. Okay. There we go. So this is this um, Bread Boy thing. And I guess this is what I'll talk about next time. It's got the screen on it. And uh, I'll wait till next time. But basically what it does is it captures the image that you're seeing, the NeoPixels that are running right there on the, on the virtual Bread Boy screen and it, it pushes them here. So you get the impression that you've actually got that, that, that um, NeoPixel uh, array next to your actual device. And I've got a little video actually. Uh, let me just stop that. This is kind of like a preview for what I'll talk about next time. I know we're all going to have a number of questions for you too. So this is what that same thing looks like. Um, in the, the Red Boy. So instead of, it, it actually casts then that screenshot to the, the display so that you get the impression that you're working with real hardware. So in this case, before I imported the Arduino into virtual breadboard, and this time I'm exporting the NeoPixel array to the outside world so that it becomes like a little portable collection of, you know, um, components of all kinds. So, for the P2, might you consider making the mixed reality with the HDMI display? Right. So this is, this is you can call this step one, right? It's uh, the plastics are available because uh, I've been work, working with this guy. Uh, you happen to have the right size and uh, just give him a little shout out here. Kilo, here we go. So we're... It was a convenient size, convenient form power. I'm a little bit worried about the power. I'm not sure yet uh, if the P2 will get too hot in there. I don't think so. I think it should be okay. So, you know, I'm currently designing it right now. Um, and uh, so I'll show you this little mixed reality video then. Why not? Since I'm doing it, this is, this is where I almost went to a Kickstarter with this product, with the, the propeller. Um, This is where my imagination got a bit carried away. <laughs> uh, and so this is also looking a little bit to the future as well. And when we move more into mixed reality, you know, we have some of the things like the HoloLens more, more widely available. And, uh, you know, this is, I'll pick this sort of R and D kind of, I, I got myself a HoloLens at one point. I thought, well, what can I do with this thing? <laughs> so I started uh, blending it together. This, is, this, this idea is particularly cool where you, get, where you can mark up real world things and project um, components. So this mix and mock stuff, so I think can be quite fun. So you can make a virtual version of your you know, instrument or whatever it is. Uh, and the visual programming, this is where I, the beginning of the TLC stuff. Um, but in this case, you're, you're actually programming 
Well, this, you might recognize the little micro bit, uh, what are they, little bits or whatever. And uh, James, I remember seeing the, these videos for this project and that was, I was really blown away. It's a really interesting thing. I don't know what the practical side of it is, but it, <laughs> it's very stimulating. <laughs> well, you know, I think the practical side won't pop out for like another five or 10 years. For it to be practical, everyone's got to have like a HoloLens or, or glasses, which you, which you, you know, and I guess that's coming, you know, give it 10 years. Uh, one really cool concept here is that why have anything real when you can just project it onto yeah, the, onto I, the I mean, you, you, you could be uh, beautiful. You could live in a mansion. I saw yeah, this, right. this uh, story on this economic site once it talked about how uh, people were running the software that uh, Ikea gives to allow you to visualize the Ikea furniture in your home. And they were positing, right. well, maybe this is going to be a deflationary event because if people have these glasses, they'll just load their house up with all this stuff that doesn't exist and live in this virtualization and then uh, not good for the real economy. Yeah, that's, uh, what was that? Um, oh, there was a movie not long ago which featured something like that where they, they live in a concrete the actual room was a concrete you know, room and then they just put their glasses on and then they, they, they just live in this magnificent room. And, you know, some of these possibilities, uh, you know, are coming down the track. And uh, one interesting one is that mixing and matching hardware solutions like uh, this uh, Ardu boy is quite fun. So this is where this idea here is where I, 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 I run you saw before that I was I was capturing the the, the, the signal from a AT mega. Well, in this case, I'm I'm, I'm capturing it from a AT you know um, mega 32 uh, U4 or whatever, which has got the the um, the Ardu boy code on it. So this is capturing at the signal level, and then you can cast it to different places. So this is casting the Ardu boy games to the to 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 this uh, bread bread boy, uh, for example. So we can, we can do mixing and matching. Who knows what the practical applications are? But, you know, as you've probably figured out, I'm kind of half artist, half, ex, you know, experimental engineer. <laughs> I do a lot of sort of research projects and, and then try to pay my way as I go along. by. Well, we always have to extract the, the businessman out of you engineers. And um, <laughs> here's a data point. So since March, I've had a number of calls from teachers looking for tools to simulate parallax hardware because it was all locked up at school and everyone got sent home right and uh, i've tried all kinds of things like well we'll send you robots drop ship to your students homes and that works but what they seem to be settling on now is uh the, the need for software tools to simulate that are cheap or free and also low-cost hardware they can do an awful lot of things yeah kind of what yeah. you're talking about here yeah yeah so there's, there's like whole whole conversations to be had there about there that, are but know. inevitably the language comes up and i'm dealing with them because they still want to connect this back i mean i can see you're thinking about um programmatic thinking and how things flow together and and that is programming but then they eventually want to connect it back to the language and have access to well how about java um was was quite favored in education for for hardware lately the focus has been on python um which is gaining popularity even in many arduino places yeah so this is this is the other the other end i've got an integrated java environment here that you can you can debug and develop for the question is why why it's not working right now it's a interesting question but uh, you want to you want to i mean look there's there's a really very interesting aspect to some of these new features here um uh, where are we going to see that easiest it didn't work just then so uh, unit tests uh, um, Maybe we can uh, pop a few questions in here too. Anybody you want to ask um, while James cues this up without uh, sidetracking him too much? So this this is a, uh, what is this? This, this is, uh, 
this is this is very interesting for higher a bit more you know higher level education i suppose uh, this is where you're writing unit tests in, um, in in the java language and driving the hardware and collecting the, the results so if you want to like uh, talk language uh, you can really teach um, I guess it's, I don't know what, what, what level, um, who, who you mostly deal with, uh, but in terms of language, the best way I can support um, is, uh, is, is through the integrated uh, Java environment, basically, but, but we'll have to have, there's a whole other, that's a whole other issue, a whole other topic, so to speak, so I won't jump into it, <laughs> otherwise I'll get, I'll get sidetracked. Any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, I actually do have another one again. Um, so basically, you you are building all this as an object tree, and then you could basically do Java code or Arduino or P two or Tacos or so. So you you abstracted the whole thing into an object tree, and then you are generating um, code. Okay, so there's two coding engines inside Virtual Breadboard. One is the Java. This is actual Java. So it's my own JVM. I take this actual Java code and convert it into bytecode and execute the actual Java. So that's actually um, proper, you know, um, code, so to speak. But the TLC stuff, uh, yes, this is what you said. The TLC is, is represented internally as an, as an object tree. And then the concept is you, you, you can pick a different uh, runtime uh, which is not properly linked up yet, and um, which would then, you know, auto-generate the code for different platforms. However, there has to be a mark, uh, like a, a, an, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated job, you know, to to produce uh, a code generator for this object tree for a particular platform for a particular, you know, application. In this case, I, I, I knew I was building uh, this thing with a P2 in it. And I knew I have access to the TLC and I knew that Peter had the tacos and I thought, you know what, this is pretty close to fourth and the, 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 um, the, the cog, uh, shared cog pool, uh, the thread pool would be an easy RTOS and that would be an easy win. That's where this really came from. Um, but the, there is, of course. So you got hooked on the ROM and tacos and said, oh yeah, that might work. Well, because I was already designing it in, so it's on top of mind, and I thought, well, what else can I do with this little thing? This looks a lot like, for example, a you know a Lego's Mindstorms controller. You know, put the P2 in here with the, it's got a little um, connector here. But when I do the P2 version, I'll, I'll make a cutout so that it can connect in two places. Put a little motor driver um, accessory board on it, and you've got a you've got a um, a Mindstorms uh, type controller which you can you know um, I did this is pretty cool what we are building there yeah so because I'm, I'm uh, look <laughs> uh, a little little teaser then if you want if you're a real coding person um, I'll talk more about this next time for the actual avatar construction this is really where it's at for me I built a um, in visual studio now a uh, a full environment for developing this thing and you know maybe i'll bring it up i don't know or maybe you, know. you guys are all p2 addicts so why not uh pill m one one of the real thing but you know these tools that you build they're you know internal tools because you just like tacos in a way people are scratching their heads and saying well how, how do i use this tacos um because peter's you know it's he, he built it so he knows exactly how it works so in in the same sense i have this code generator here um, which allows me to um, run like full debug unit tests so you, you saw before you know the the ws232 um Projects. So this is where that was developed um, for the propeller. Um, so this is where I, I cut my teeth on learning how to write 
you call these like anti-drivers. Um, I don't know if you can see any of this, but uh, you know, um, what happens if I run a unit test? This is now a few years old. I haven't really done much with it lately. So uh, test that. right. So, but it allows me to set up, for example, here, I can create a new propeller, I can build an application and I can, you know, run a whole emulated environment in the background as a, as a unit test. So let's see what happens. But I have to prepare, if I'm going to talk about this, I'll have to prepare properly, you know. This is just probably won't work. But so wow. here I'm running... Just, wow. So here I'm running like dozens and dozens of simultaneous um, applications in the background for uh, the propeller. Uh, yeah. So this is how you, you know, and then what I do, you can set breakpoints. Well, anyway, I'll have to prepare it properly, but you can set breakpoints and you can debug and you can, and it's also got a code generator in there. So I also got like open spin, um, which is all kind of broken, as you know, what happens after a while. But the, the basic idea is that I write it in C sharp, uh, the actual code, I'm jumping all around here, as I said, I've got to prepare properly to discuss it. Uh, I, I write it in sort of kind of a pseudo code um, and then I have a, a code converter which reads this and then converts it back to actual uh, spin, which then gets compiled. But I'll, I'll have to properly prepare to really discuss this. Um, but this is the tool I need to upgrade to P2 for me to really get stuck into this, this, this new project where I will, these are all anti-drivers. So you guys are all writing driver objects, you know, drivers. So you're, you might write an S, you know, a 13 SSD driver, you know, but, and I'm writing the anti-driver. So I then have to capture it and then compress it and compact it and put in a frame buffer and then send it to virtual breadboard, which then visualizes it and then sends it and then casts it wherever else I want to put it. So that will be what I, I'll get that, I'll get that corded over to P2 and then I will come back and give you, you know, an update on that in, in a following presentation in, in a month or so. So, but I think we're pretty much on, uh, I don't know what else. So I, I guess I'll just answer questions because I guess we're on, we're, we're, we're run over time now. It's totally okay. You guys could unmute yourself and ask away or type it if you prefer. Can you also see the chat, James? On the chat I, I did. Icon. I did see a few pop up. I, I haven't. Oh yeah, that's right. It keeps hiding itself, doesn't it? Participants. Do you want to click on that? More chat. Chat. Here we go. Right. Found it. It's very impressive what you're accomplishing on your own here, having been through some of this with Blockly prop and just dealing with multiple cogs and uh, not having a lot of rules in place to check for problems that we might create or ability to, but trying to code around it. Um, it's a fair amount of work. Yeah, like, that's right. I guess I'm a bit uh, obsessive. <laughs> There's a, a point where people have to stop and understand a little bit about the architecture and know what's happening too. But what I like about this is you brought the parallel processing totally to the surface. Yeah, no, look, for me, the, the, it's, it's, uh, it's a unique application for me where I, I need to have the ability to have basically any peripheral and multiple peripherals on any pin so that I can basically dynamically prepare, dynamically um, prepare a sort of a, a capture interface and then load it up. It's got to happen real fast. It's got to happen within, within seconds. And yeah, we, uh, it's, uh, I can answer some questions here. So 
Um, some of the event, yeah, right. So, yeah, and that obviously you have that other um, slides that the uh, these other guys haven't got yet. But there's some um, big advantages for this particular application for me. You know, uh, right. This is the one I was sort of referring to. I'll try to answer some questions. Uh, yeah, for me, um, I, I, I needed, I had a unique situation. You already saw it with the, when I first did this, this is like five, six years ago. In fact, it's almost 10 years, the very first version of what I called the ice shield back then. And um, it was done with the sort of a pic micro with fixed um, like uh, pins. Some of the I think, two, six, something or other um, pic micro. And uh, that, I kind of got away with it a little bit because it was for a shield. And so the shields have fixed pins and kind of, then that kind of worked okay for the Arduino. I could sell quite a few of those. But um, as I progress forward, then I'm, I'm upgrading the chips and I'm, I'm, I'm basically got into like upgrade hell <laughs> um, because I wanted to be able to do more with it generically and so that's where i sort of realized the, the propeller was the way to go now since then some of these new modern um pig micros have got uh, mappable pins at least you know it's not arbitrary though it's still you know um you've got to pick and choose groups i guess and that that helped me build this other um you know this this what I call the the BB micro, which is which is the first avatar proof of concept implementation. I write this actually the code on my pick here. I call it my pick. That's Java. I I actually write these applications in Java. Um, from that Java toolchain you saw in Virtual Breadboard. So I have my own Java compiler, so to speak, um, and. Uh, that's also been up through several upgrade cycles. You know, I've, I had to. Uh, it started on pick eight, 16 f 877s It's now works. It uh, uh, upgraded to uh, the latest ones, which is the 18 f um, q 43s which are really quite a quite a useful pick micro. And they've got like DMA channels and all this stuff that they never had um, in the in the picks. So, uh, but now I've been fooling a little bit more around with these. Someone asked about which which chips I'm using on there. Um, I I had uh, I'm using my pick micro. Um, let me see if we can one second. This um LPC and that's that's simply because that was what was already used in the Paquito and. Uh, uh, its main thing I need it for is, well, it does the two jobs of the LCD and the, the UART and my, my PIC and the P2. Um, this is just a rough layout. I've still got to really get into it, um, the actual routing. Um, but that's going to be real fun. <laughs> I'm looking forward to having that running. Well, James, based on where you're going, what will we be seeing next time you share this? Next time, next time I will have a, a hopefully a running Red Boy with a P2 in it and an upgraded um, P2 uh, development environment, and I'll be able to show you some um, and a bunch of interfaces. So that's the whole thing. Is this this whole this interface here is where I put the adapters, and then the adapters can go to anything. Like then I'll I'll have feather boards, and I'll have you know micro bit and I'll have all those sort of things. So then they will, just like the, the Arduino did in the, in, the, um, in the application that you saw, they will appear in Virtual Breadboard. And then, so you have, this is a two-way street. So you, you can either import the microcontroller. So this is a way for me to import basically any kind of microcontroller into Virtual Breadboard. And that's kind of the real reason I did this is, it, you know, I develop simulators. Virtual Breadboard's got simulators, you know, it's got a, Simulator for the um, some pick micros and also for that Arduino chip. But basically, 
I noticed Virtual Burger getting less popular with Arduino because people are starting to move on from that particular chip. People are moving to ARM and, and you know, the market's exploded as well. I mean, sort of 10 years ago, there was a much smaller range of chips involved and now it's really huge. So I needed a way to not just get super niched out like into one little chip. You know, I wanted to build an, an expanding universe. And so you saw there how we built, you know, a basic uh, TLC controller, I will show you next week how you can build um, avatar controllers like this, this, this micro view, for example. So that micro view, can, that's an avatar based component. So I'll show that next time where you use this toolkit. So we built a TLC controller, then you'll be able to build avatar controls. And this is where I want to get other users involved in building modules based on avatars to import their micro controls into virtual breadboard and then also export the um, you know the components back out again. So in the end, you'll have hopefully a lot of people contributing these libraries, and then you'll be able to just download other people's libraries and, and then run them. So that's that's really the big the big play in the end. We'll be shipping virtual products to virtual customers, having virtual fun, <laughs> virtual money. Yeah, but they, but they do need they they do need some real hardware though, just a little bit, point. just a little bit of real hardware to run the rest. You know what I mean? That's yeah. Well, having said that. <laughs> I get crazy. I have also a cloud version idea where I'm going to host these in the cloud and then project them all over the over the cloud. So basically, any any market, and I've also proof of concept of that too. So. Well, as you know, like Parallax has always been very focused on the breadboard and circuit building and making that part of everything we do. But the Arduino shifted so much of the thinking towards pluggable approaches, and uh, that's just becoming more common and desired right now can I buy a part for it and just plug it together? And people are asking us all the time, just want to connect it. What parts do I need? Give me a list. Yeah, I think, I think you're right about the way that the Arduino and what uh, just the whole open source concept has shifted the thinking. Um, I'm going to try to get this chat. Thing so as we proceed with these, with the clickboards from micro electronica, that might be interesting for you as well. Well, that's exactly right. So you end up, what you do is you build, you build virtual clipboards. And then we're, you can, we share the idea of not making tons of hardware. Yeah. So then what you do is you build a virtual clipboard that, you know, those sort of smaller component ideas are uh, easier um, to build and then you, you, you publish them and then you can share them. And so then you download it and then it appears here, you know, next to your actual hardware while you're developing. So the, the whole idea of that is to sort of give it more reality, like, to pull it out of the virtual world. And the other big advantage of this idea is that I don't have to have every single component in virtual breadboard. That's the other thing that I've really run up with, that if it's purely virtual and in a complete sandbox, then it's not useful unless you have everything. Yeah. Whereas this is useful when you, when you for the components that are there, see? So that changes the framing of, of the product to being an accessory you use with your development tool rather than a sandbox that's got to contain everything. Because that was always the thing. It's like, do you have some really bizarre, and why don't you have it? <laughs> this really bizarre component from somewhere else. And I said, well, the idea here is that you can export the ones that you do have and use them, you know, maybe with a speaker or something that, that isn't supported or some accelerometer that isn't supported. Because there's just some components that you can't simulate, right? So, um, so, based on physical things or whatever. So this is where I, I kind of make it a, a toolbox that works with what you're doing rather than an exclusive environment. Totally awesome. And the software design is really good too. Yeah, it's funny that it's a love-hate thing because um, <laughs> Virtual Breadboard, this is now the sort of the Windows, the Windows um, store version. And of course, I've had previous versions and everyone loved those versions because they got used to them. And then you make the new version, they go, oh, I hate this. <laughs> but if you haven't seen it before and, and Windows 10 is sort of evolving along now, it's kind of got this um, uh, paint 3D, uh, what was that, paint 3D styling, you know, sort of the Windows 10-ish styling that you start getting familiar with, right? So then, 
whereas uh, previous people, you know, you got used to the sort of Windows Forms styling. And so over time, it was a big, look, it was a big, at the time it was a big decision because Microsoft came out, if you remember, they said, well, Windows, Windows 8, you know, uh, Windows Metro, that's it, you know, and they said to developers, where everything's, <laughs> everything's deprecated. It's got to be an app and nothing else is going to be the case, you know, so then you go, okay, well, great. I'm an ISV and I've got this huge code base and I'm going to move all of that to Windows Universal, otherwise I don't exist. So that's what happened. But in the end, I think it's been, it's been a good thing um, because, you know, I must admit, I think at least 30 to 40% of my time has just been in keeping up with the latest version of Windows or language or casting it to, to, to whatever the new, the new thing is. The last, the last thing was moving to asynchronous. So, so this whole async, dot, dot net async, which is what is the modern way of developing. And now the next move is uh, to take it to the web. So I've actually got a, a research version, which works as a, as a Docker. A Docker yeah, kind tool. of a stupid question really, but can you compile output for other platforms and run this in a, in a web? page or yeah, yeah um, that's that's what i was just about to say that the uh, the next windows universal is not like that it's it's only windows only and I, I thought that by now they would solve that problem and, and and allow it to run on other platforms but the 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 next step is what's called dot net core and so i've got an experimental and i'll probably show that next time too an experimental version which takes my core product wraps it into what's called um, like a, a Docker thing, which I can then publish. And I've got a, a rendering solution for casting the screens to the browser. So I do have the browser version on the way, but that's like, uh, that, that won't be probably generally available for another year or so. Yeah, but it's always thinking ahead because it's always got to, you got to, it's always got to move like that. So in that case, the actual application then runs in the, in the cloud server and it, it actually casts the, the screen in a very lightweight um, render it to the, to the browser. And I've already, I've actually, I've already got a, uh, uh, the base renderer working for that. So that's kind of what took me ages to kind of decide which the hell way to do that. Um, but uh, I think I have a good solution for that now. Well, we're about half past the hour. Any questions for James? Oh, look at that. I've used previous versions. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. <laughs> uh, just reading some questions here. Yeah, I think the hard part is, you know, on your own, um, you don't have the resources. You know, you always want to have better tutorials and better, better, um, but I think, I think that this new uh, online need could really help speed some of this stuff up and uh, get people. Yeah, one thing you could do is run an uh, event here on Zoom where teachers are actually using the tool. Yeah. They're always yeah, willing yeah. to do that and they, they could run it in parallel. They've gotten quite good at running software and watching a Zoom meeting and setting up uh, tablets and monitors to do this? Well, I mean, a first step might be to flesh out, you know, that um, it's quite easy now actually to um, build the TLC based components. So like maybe the P2D2 um, uh, or maybe this this board and, and, and add, you know, like a couple of dozen essential um, examples and then uh, also you know the steps to creating that because there's actually a lot more than I've actually shown you it takes I wanted to show you the process of building components and publishing them and, and from scratch but that's not how you would go ahead teaching you know you, you'd have pre-built examples and you would think out you know what the best way to communicate that is and then you would build coursework that that links that you know together but I do think the visual programming is uh, where you're building programs without actually writing any actual code, but using basically iconography, which marks up the actual um, 
program. You know, you can read it just by by looking at the. Oh, I mean, I totally agree with that. Not being much of a programmer and hassling Chip and Jeff every time I have a minor question, I just fell in love with the Blockly concept. And Google pushes pushed it really hard at their summit um, to show yeah. some real real yeah, applications. I know and CNC and so machines up. and whatever it is. And so this is if it could be easier for people to do impressive things, why shouldn't it be? Well, I think the key, I mean, as you know, is to get that spark going, you know. Yeah. Um, obviously, you don't end up becoming, in, you know, you don't write that code professionally necessarily. But, it, well, I mean, a lot of the Duena projects are just plugging a couple of things together and then making something cool happen. I mean, if you can facilitate that visually, then, then why not? Um, but uh, the, the, the spark is the key. Um, and... Uh, it's very challenging in this day and age to capture attention from people as right. like so much competition, like, you know, with Fortnite and whatnot, it's really hard. Like, you know, the new thing we're all, you know, we're not teenagers anymore. And so back in the day, the, the new things were the Commodore 64s and the, the sort of, that was interesting. That was the hot thing, you know, that was the Fortnite of the day. And today, and I think, you know, getting your hands dirty with stuff's really fun and then it can spark an interest in building all sorts of stuff and these days the tools are so there's so much of you can build so much stuff like um, that it's still got it's still like and you know it's, what I'm trying to say is that each of these projects pulls on so many disciplines that actually completing something useful even though all these things are cheaper and, and there's so much information available, you still need to put it together in all one in, in kind of one place for people to get to the finish line. I right. The so struggle in people. education is uh, that they don't always have all the hardware they would like to have. They have what we can give them in a box. But it's so typical where they want to do something else and then, well, they need to buy some more hardware. I think the real challenge also is that it's like, okay, I've made a, I made a robot for the line. Okay, well... Where's where's my you know <laughs> remote? Where's my where's my submarine that I can drive under the water or something? You know, it's like uh, it's it's really hard to compete with with you know um, and some of the the resources required to build these projects um, is uh, so much beyond. I get, what I'm trying to these these they've got these expectations which are just so. Hi, <laughs> you know, yeah, I've got this great idea, and and it's really is really hard to bridge that gap. And so you need to find the way the tools can sort of at least at least participate in, in bridging that gap. You know, uh, James, that's the uh, that little micro bit device or whatever it was with the little screen and the buttons on it is that something that is available off the shelf, or uh, what, what's the situation with it? This thing here. Yeah, so this is this is this is going to be the whole next talk. <laughs> but basically, this is the plastics. This is something that's already it's called the Bikido, and it's really just a, it's an embed gaming platform which is available off the shelf. But I've been talking to the guy, and he's he's willing to sell me the plastics, and and he's sort of kind of working with me a little bit. So I'm kind of upgrading. You know, this is the Bikido insides, right? And I'm kind of upgrading that to be um, what I'm calling the bread boy, which integrates the P2 and my chip and also, you know, also that LCD chip, which can handle the, the communications and the, um, the LCD driving. Um, Cause also, you know, you've got a, a UR com bridge on your device too. So it's just like a, an expanded version of that. And uh, yeah, so then I, I need to design up the, the PCB and work my way through all of the, material that's available for get you know the different power supplies and all that stuff which is just you know kind of a little bit next level it's not like a big gold dip chip that you just plug in you know <laughs> but and then i've got to route it up to try to fit it into that thing with all the connectors so i don't know hopefully it fits <laughs> so uh, that's that's my next challenge well if there's any way we could help you by um sharing files uh or resources or access to customers or just giving you ideas um, please count us in. Good. That sounds good.
Yeah, and if you ever want to bring in a group of teachers when you get to that point and have them play, they love to explore like this. And it's called professional development and uh, tell you what they think and actually use tools. Virtual world lets you build submarine and goes under, underwater. Yeah, so I built actually, I, I'm not, I will wrap it up, but I'll just say one last thing. I built um, RoboPal at one point, which had like a whole virtual world with bouncing balls and robots that, that moved around and all the rest of it. But these days, there's, there's better ways of doing that. So, you know, one of the, one of the ways is you, you, you hook up with something like Unity and um, some of these gaming engines, and then you can drop in pre-made robots probably. And we can then tap in only small code controllers into the actual motors and things like that and hook that up to the virtual breadboard engine. And that's, that's kind of the projected way to build um, the 3D models and simulated physics and all the rest of it you get for free whereas i mean i did all that before but it's you can't keep up with the engines you know like like unity so this is going to be kind of the next thing where you can plug in virtual robots you you can probably even do that as quick projects uh, using unity um and and so that can be a way to really expand the interest for kids so you have the the controller over here and then then you have you know the pro level robots running through they can build or build those worlds easily in 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 the world those world building tools but then keep the programming um over over in in, in this environment so that's that's another area too i mean once you open the pandora's box it goes crazy doesn't it so yeah well when will we hear from you again september um give you yeah, some time to work i will try to slot back in another time you know the funny thing is is that i um I didn't even start this when i put it down the proposal i just knew i'd be able to do it in the time frame and having deadlines helps me get stuff done so i i, I, yeah. I put my name down for all sorts of hacks to competitions and whatnot that helps me like have these ridiculous deadlines because then that that's actually how i progress in life <laughs> I get so it. I will, Seems, that works on Chip too, because next week he has to deliver his spin to debug. Yeah, so there you go. Chip. That's, 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 that's for you next week. Um, so I will try to find an, a time slot, probably the next time slot available, and, and slot it in and then just make it happen. Great. <laughs> I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, have you considered uh, uh, converting your C sharp to WebAssembly? Uh, I have, yeah, um, and I'm I am I'm doing that um, sort of. Uh, what I, the next version is called um, is, is a Docker version. It's .NET Core, and what I'm doing is I'm going to run that actually in the cloud. And I've got a, a WebAssembly, well, uh, not even WebAssembly. I've got a proper um, uh, how did I do it? Blazor, I think, um, which which does convert to, to WebAssembly front-end viewer. So what I'm doing is I'm splitting the application into a lightweight renderer for the browser and, and like all the heavy code stays, well, dot, .NET Core is um, only one step away from Windows Universal. So that, that taking that step to help me get closer. So what, what you'll see in the end is the, the actual application running in Kubernetes or wherever it is in, in, in Microsoft Asia, and then with a lightweight link to the to the browser renderer, and that part will run in WebAssembly. Yeah. Uh, the there, are, there are there are tools that convert C sharp to WebAssembly now. They're pretty easy to use. Yeah, no, I've seen I've seen a lot of those. A lot of uh, part of the problem is just how big it is. So you got a very large virtual breadboard is quite a large application, so you'll have quite a long download time if you're going to bring it all onto WebAssembly, and also the performance, and also the um, the renderer, which is uh, Windows um, 2D. Um, basically DirectX, so I need to convert that to Canvas, which is the, the web thing. So I've got to port that part. So I can't really just press a button and make it all happen. I wish I could. I tried. I tried to use Unity. I tried to use uh, several ways to just sort of press a button and convert it. But uh, unfortunately, I have to break it up. And in the end, it'll, it, it's the right approach. But um, yeah. it's very tempting. The other way, I, I did try to do it was with virtual virtual UI where you can also, it's kind of like um, a bit like this Zoom browser, it's running on a remote computer and it's, you know, like a remote desktop style approach. You know, that, that's the other idea too. But uh, I think the best, the .NET Core approach is the best one. Yeah. Have you checked out the tools from, from uh, Rem Objects? 
No, I haven't. I haven't necessarily. Oh, I might have actually. I, I did. I look. I've, I've tried. Um, what's it? You, so I would. You know, I would have a look. Look at your uh, C sharp tools for converting. It's to called RAM, RAM object. I, I will have. I'll have a look. I have, I did a lot of research on this. How to how to get how to solve the browser problem. How to get into the browser and uh, make it really you know work properly. And then you can buy this book. What's that one? It's 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 you just a back. general web assembly one. Oh, the web assembly. Yeah, there's a lot of did a lot of work in web assembly. Um, it's it's uh, it's I think it's good for, for probably small applications. Um, oh, okay. So let everybody go to bed, start their day, go home, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> and I want to thank you again, James. This is was really neat. So much more than I thought, too. Good. <laughs> Problem is when you've got so much material, it's hard to know how to dice it up, you know. And uh, so I think I think this is a kind of like a good a good um, introduction to the toolbox, basically. Yeah, and there are a lot of people developing here uh, different things, and they appreciate the under the hood approach. Okay, well, I guess I'll see you guys again in a few weeks time and uh, with something even more tangible, it'll be fun. And I'll be looking forward Sounds to great. Very much. Okay, thanks all for attending. Thank you all, thank you all for watching. <laughs> Talk soon, bye now. Okay, bye everyone.